Okay, I'd like to read uh, this evening uh, from Romans, the book of Romans, two readings. Uh, one of them is from chapter 10 and one of them from chapter 1. We'll begin in the one in chapter 10, where we read Paul's words in verses 1 through 3. He says, Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. For I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. For they, being ignorant of God's righteousness and going about to establish their own righteousness, have not submitted themselves unto the righteousness of God. For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. And then, please, in Romans 1, very familiar words, Verses 15 through 17, he says, So as much as in me is, I am ready to preach the gospel to you that are, are at Rome also. For I am not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation to everyone that believeth, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. For therein is the righteousness of God revealed from faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. I want to, for a few minutes this evening, talk about a Jewish evangelist. We, of course, know how much the Lord has used Jewish evangelists in the world. Men like Peter, uh, preaching the gospel uh, to Cornelius and his household. We think of Stephen. We think of Philip, the evangelist, going into Samaria. We think of, of course, the Apostle Paul. And we're very grateful for these great evangelists that uh, had a passion. Their zeal uh, that they had in Judaism was now, as it were, used, honed for spreading the gospel of the Lord Jesus and, and what zeal they had. And of course, in the future, we're also going to be, uh, the world is going to be blessed once again with 144,000 Jewish evangelists during the tribulation period, as well as the two witnesses. And so we can see something of their ministry in the early days of Christianity. We can see after the rapture, they'll be active again. But what about in between? Uh, what about after the end of the church age? Well, <clears throat> we can we can thank the Lord that, that he, he has worked uh, amongst Jews. In the 19th century, God saved a number of wonderful Jewish Bible scholars that many of us profited from their writings, men like Alfred Edersheim uh, and his wonderful book, The Life and Times of Jesus the Messiah. And then, of course, there was Adolf Safier, uh, another converted Jew, did a wonderful job in, in his epistle uh, to the Hebrews, his commentary on the epistle to the Hebrews. And then perhaps my favorite of them all, David Barron, uh, wrote a marvelous commentary on the book of Zechariah. And then in the 20th century, again, God was saving Jewish scholars. And one of them was a man called Charles Lee Feinberg. And uh, I can honestly tell you that his commentary on Ezekiel is just about matchless. It's really excellent. He also wrote on Jeremiah, the minor prophets, very, very helpful. But all of these were notable teachers. And the question is, well, what about evangelists? Were, were, were there any Jewish evangelists? So I want to talk about a 20th century Jewish evangelist. I haven't mentioned his name yet. And the reason that this man came to my attention was through a book that Brother Mark Galabois is familiar with because I gave him a copy. It's called Revival Today. And it's uh, kind of 365 daily devotions that are based on church history, challenging devotions from revival history. And uh, I was reading uh, one of these and I came across this, this marvelous quote from a Jewish evangelist, and I thought, I've got to find out more about this man. I'm going to give you the quote later on in our little session, but I want to give his life story as a little bit of background. And his name was Hyman Jedediah Appleman. Hyman Jedediah Appleman. He was born January the 7th, 1902, and he died May 29th, 1983 in, of all places, Kansas City, Missouri, where I was preaching last weekend. 
that's where he ended his journey. Now he is already in the suite by and by, and we certainly look forward to meeting him, as well as many of these uh, men that we've talked about and women that we've talked about in our little studies. Uh, what a joy it will be to meet them, but most of all, uh, of course, it'll be overshadowed by meeting face to face with Christ our Savior. But as we think about this man, uh, I want to just kind of talk a little bit about his story as a fitting background to the quotation. First of all, his upbringing, he was born on the banks of the Dnieper, Dnieper River in Russia. Dnieper, I don't know how you pronounce that, in Russia, of Orthodox Jewish parents. He was reared and trained in the Jewish faith by strict grandparents, a grandfather and mother who were very zealous in Judaism. One time as a boy, he was thrown from a horse and the horse stamped on him and almost killed him. For days afterwards, he wore a kind of straight jacket and he always remembered the day it, that he got to take that straight jacket off. It was such a relief that he later described his salvation experience in exactly the same language, that it was such a relief to be set free from the bondage of sin. It was like being set free from that terrible straight jacket that he had to wear all those years as a child. His father had come to America a year and a half prior to the rest of the family arriving. He arrived with his mom and three young brothers in December 1914. They had not suffered from pogroms or anything like that, but the father could see the writing on the wall. He could see that things were not going to go well for the Jews of Eastern Europe. And so in December 1914, he arrived. And uh, again, just a, a young chap, but he knew Hebrew and had a fair command of German, Russian, Yiddish, and Polish. Sometimes you, you think we, we struggle with English, and here are these people speaking four or five languages and their children, which is amazing. He was enrolled in the Hans Christian Andersen Public School in Chicago. And he was a 13-year-old boy. He weighed 150 pounds and had to sit in first grade in those tiny little first grade seats despite the handicap of learning a new language because he didn't know any english he went through the first eight grades in two years but you can tell this guy is a smart cookie i mean there's no question about it and uh, he got high marks along the way he then went to prep school and eventually uh, he enrolled at university, and he enrolled in two universities at the same time, Northwestern and DePaul University, and worked on two degrees at the same time. And so uh, he graduated uh, the highest in his class, was awarded a scholarship, uh, got a license to practice law, and from 1918 to 1921, he was uh, involved in law, uh, continuing as far as 1925, but also teaching law in the university that he graduated from. So, so this, this man is obviously a very capable man. Uh, he's teaching school, attending school, practicing law all at the same time and, and excelling in all of them. And uh, despite all that, he wasn't very religious and he was not what you would call irreligious either. He belonged to the synagogue, uh, but only attended three times a year. Uh, presumably at the time of the festivals. He was like what we'd say many a Roman Catholic, you know, they would go to uh, Mass at Christmas and Easter, uh, but that'd be about it. Well, he was just like that. And uh, so despite that, he he lived a, a fairly moral life. Uh, he he didn't uh, gamble, didn't drink, had a, a nice Jewish girlfriend, had never had any contact with the New Testament at all. But despite his... Uh, his life uh, of success in so many ways, he felt there was no satisfaction. He tried to drown out this nagging feeling that none of this was really satisfying by working harder. And he became what is known as a workaholic, just driving himself into activity. In the fall of 1924, he just about had a nervous breakdown. He was told to stay away from work, to get some rest. In fact, uh, even then, 
he was still kind of thinking about cases and working and all this kind of stuff, even though he was supposed to be at home. Finally, one night when he came home, he found a conference. His father, mother, brother in law, brother, law partner, family doctor were all talking and they were all talking about him. And they said, you have to take a vacation and you have to go at least a thousand miles away from this office in Chicago. <laughs> And so he decided he'd go west. And he he ended up in leaving in December in 1924. His first destination was Kansas City. And he checked into a YMCA, which was very common in those days that people traveling would, would often, if they didn't have flush with cash, they'd stay in the YMCA hostel. And he did. And uh, while he was there, um, checking in on Saturday, the Jewish Sabbath, he was in the lobby of the YMCA, and an argument began to break out, and he got involved in this argument. Being a lawyer, he loved talking, and he loved kind of getting into arguments, and he went from 4 o'clock till 10 p.m. that night. He went to bed at 10, and later that night, an elderly man knocked on his door and introduced himself as a Mr. Daly, D-A-L-Y, a reporter from the Kansas City Star. He'd been involved in the argument downstairs, and for one hour, daily witness to Appleman about the Lord Jesus Christ. He left after he got Appleman to promise to read the New Testament. Hyman saw a Gideon Bible, and he opened it. I've got to step back a little bit now, because one time while he was in Chicago, he remembered walking by a street meeting, and hearing one phrase from a street preacher as he passed by, the phrase he never forgot, and this was the phrase, if a man wanted religion in a hurry, he should read John. If a man wanted religion in a hurry, he should read John. And so he searched in the New Testament, presuming that's where he would find it, found the Gospel of John, and he began to read about it, managed to get five lines of reading, and, and then... Uh, someone knocked at the door again. This man identified himself as a Mr. Garrett and asked Hyman to go to Sunday school with him that day, the next day. Appleman didn't have the heart to say no, and he attended a Methodist church in Kansas City. Afterwards, after the Sunday school hour was finished, Appleman agreed to stay and attend the main service and he, he had been to a few Catholic services, of course, living in Chicago, that would be pretty obvious, but he'd never been to a Protestant service before. And one thing he noticed, no pictures, no statues, no crosses, no holy water, no robes, and no, uh, none of these things. And his thought was, don't these people have any religion at all? <laughs> and that was his first thought. Uh, he'd never seen anything like this before. And, and, and he stayed through the service, but it didn't make any sense to him. He went to see the rabbi the next day and then traveled further on on his journey. Uh, he went to see folks in St. Louis, kinfolk, family members, then to Omaha, Nebraska, and finally ended up in Del Denver, Colorado in March 1925. In 1925, he had a health crisis and he dropped in weight from 213 to 151 pounds. That's significant weight loss. And he was concerned about his health and he just, things weren't getting any better for him. And so he again was staying in a YMCA. He asked the, uh, the secretary if he could recommend a good doctor. And he said, well, he said, I don't know a doctor, but he said, the guy across the road, uh, Central Christian Church of Denver, Colorado, he is a wonderful counselor and all the doctors in town go to his church. So uh, go listen to him. If he can't help you, he'll put you in touch with the right doctor. So he went over to the largest Christian church in, in the town at the time and uh, spoke to Dr. Davis, this man who was the pastor of this church. The conversation started at 3 p.m. and lasted past midnight. Finally, Dr. Davis told him, you do not need a doctor my boy, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. Well, that's a great piece of advice. You do not need a doctor, you need the Lord Jesus Christ. Dr. Davis thoroughly explained the whole truth of the Savior, and Appleman drank it in. 
The preacher dropped to his knees, put his arm around Appleman and began to pray with tender, broken voice, great tears coursing down his cheeks. There's a battle going on. Remember, this man's a Jew and he's a lawyer. And so he loves an argument, but there's a battle going on for the man's soul. And the devil was losing the fight, especially as the evangelist, Dr. Davis, was in tears pleading with this man to receive Christ. The battle mostly going on in the heart of Mr. Appleman was this. He knew that if he received Christ, his parents, his four brothers and sisters, all being Jews, would have their hearts broken if Hyman became a Christian. But the preacher refused to surrender his soul to the enemy. Appleman, upon hearing, of course, he, he asked him if he would read from, from Romans 10 and verse 9. And he asked him, well, explain it to me. And so finally, through clenched teeth, this is the prayer that Mr. Appleman prayed. Lord, I do not know and I do not understand. But this man says, and this book says, that your son died for my sins. And that if I ask you, Two, for his sake, you will forgive my sins. Lord, for Jesus' sake, do forgive my sins. And that night, he passed from death to life. The next day, he was baptized. And then he wrote a telegram home. And it simply said this, I'm a Christian. I've been baptized. I've joined the church. I'm praying for you. He was 23 years old. Well, there was considerable rejection from his family. A re reply came back the same day, a telegram, come on home. During that week, he received at least a dozen telegrams and letters. The next week, his sweetheart came, and but she refused to stay in Denver unless he would abandon this nonsense. He refused, and their engagement was ended. His com conversion naturally created a great store, stir sorry, in the Jewish circles, and he became an outcast from his family. Because of this, he wanted to stay longer in Denver, learn the scriptures more, so he might get a chance to go back to Chicago and reach his family. And doors opened, and he began to preach. And uh, the local church where he was going, the pastor was on vacation. He was asked to preach, and he preached with great liberty. And that evening, after preaching morning and evening, he received a telegram from home saying his mother was dying. He took the first train home. And when he got home, he found out that his father had faked the message to get Hyman home and to plead with him to reconsider his ways. When Appleman refused, the father, with indignation and wrath, said, when your sides come together from hunger and you come crawling to my door, I will throw you a crust of bread as I would any other dog. Very discouraging. Tremendous rejection. But <clears throat> the Lord continued to work in his life. September 4th, 1930, he married a girl called Verna Cook. and Feeling a definite call to the ministry, he went to Southwest Baptist Theological Seminary in Fort Worth, Texas, and uh, was there from 1930 to 33, and then began to pass to different churches. But eventually, they could see his great gift in the gospel. And so he was appointed to be the, uh, as it were, the evangelist for the Southern Baptists in the whole Texas circuit. And he began to go around preaching the gospel uh, from December 1933, right the way through to 1942, faithfully ministering for eight years, end-to-end -end crusades in Southern Baptist Convention churches. Eventually, he felt like the Lord was opening wider doors, and he began to become a, a well-known itinerant evangelist. In fact, he went eight times around the world, <laughs> made three trips to Russia as an evangelist, 1957, 59, 63. His 40th year of evangelistic meetings in 1974, he had 48 campaigns in 19 states. Now listen to this. 
he spent 51 weeks of the year on the road. Can you imagine that? 51 weeks of the year on the road. During his life, Appleman's schedule of meetings left one breathless. It was hard to find a day in 45 years when he was not preaching somewhere. An average Appleman year would see some 7,000 first-time professions of faith. By 1969, he had seen over 345,000 decisions for Christ, with some 270,000 uniting with churches and over 125,000 Christians rededicating their lives to live wholeheartedly for God. Pastor James Stewart of the First Baptist Church of Concord, New Hampshire, said this. This has been the greatest single week in the 140 years of the history of this church. That was after a week of Appleton's preaching. Now, isn't that something? I mean, well, can you imagine going and preaching for a week in an in a, in assembly? And they're saying this is the most significant <laughs> week in 140 years of the history of this church. But that was the kind of impact that this man had. So what is this quotation that has kind of stirred my interest in this very capable evangelist? This is what he says. I'm going to read it nice and slowly because this is relevant to all of us. Appleman preached. Revival will come today when enough of us go back. Back to Pentecost. Back to the book of Acts. Back to the upper room of prayer. Back to the tarrying commanded by the, commanded by the Lord for Holy Ghost power. Back to restudy, reanalyzing, realigning ourselves and our churches with the program of the apostolic days, when with nothing but surrendered lives, filled with the Holy Spirit, showing the world Jesus Christ. Now, let me just, I'm going to read that again one more time, because there's just so much in there, but I love what he's saying. Revival will come today when enough of us go back, back to Pentecost, back to the book of Acts, back to the upper room of prayer, back to the tarrying commanded by the Lord for Holy Ghost power, back to restudy, reanalyzing, and realigning ourselves and our churches to the program of the apostolic days, when with nothing but surrendered lives, filled with the Holy Spirit, showing the world Jesus Christ. When I looked at his life, what I saw was when Paul said, my heart's desire and prayer to God for Israel is that they might be saved. And then he says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God, but not according to knowledge. But when some of these Jews get saved, they retain that zeal of God, but this time the knowledge of the gospel. And what energy this man had to preach up and down the country and around the globe, of course, he could eventually preach in seven different languages. And God used this man, many of us have maybe not heard of him, but God used this man to reach many souls for the Lord Jesus. And he tried to go to the Jew first. <laughs> and then, of course, like the Apostle Paul of old, he was used greatly to reach many Gentiles with the gospel. But what about us? Well, just taking his advice, when enough of us go back, back to the upper room, back to Pentecostal power. And again, don't misunderstand me. I'm not looking for the gift of tongues or anything like that. What I am looking for is the fullness and power of the Holy Spirit to be in our preaching and in our service for the Lord, realigning ourselves and our churches to the program of apostolic days. May God help us to pursue these things. Amen.